The attendees can now hear you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out for our How to Create Great Looking Email webinar. My name is Richard, and I'm the training manager here at Vertical Response. Here with me is Alf Brand, and he's uh, our director of Marcom. Hi, everyone. Before I get started with the webinar, I wanted to mention for anyone who might not know that we just won the Small Business Computing Excellent in Tech Awards, or Technology Awards is its full name, uh, for online marketing. We won the award for best online marketing tool, and we won that over Google AdWords and Constant Contact. So we're excited about that. So today we're going to be covering two main topics. We're going to discuss best practices for creating email that gets excellent delivery and response. I'm going to be covering that part. Alpha is going to show you how to put those best practices to use when you're creating an email from scratch using the vertical response tools. After that, we're then going to close the webinar with a question and answer section, our session. Please use the question tool within the GoToWebinar application to submit your questions during the presentation. Then during the Q&A, we'll take those questions. So let's jump right into talking about best practices. I want to start by looking at the very first two things your recipients see, your from label and your subject line. First, your from label. This should always state who you are. When writing your from label, always consider what, your, what name your recipients would be most likely to recognize. This is generally going to be your company name. If you use a name your recipients aren't likely to recognize, then they're going to be far less likely to open your email and far more likely to complain about it. According to a recent survey by ReturnPath, more than half of all recipients delete mail from senders they don't recognize. So imagine if I sent a training email to all active vertical response customers, and I used a from label of Richard Huffaker instead of vertical response. Most of the recipients wouldn't know who I am, and they're going to have no reason to think the email is something they'd want to read, and so they'd just be likely to delete it. As for the subject line, one, you want to keep it fairly short. A lot of email clients cut the subject line off after 40 characters. So if you go over that, the headline of your email, which is what the subject line essentially is, is, is not going to be visible to a lot of your recipients, and that's what recipients often use to determine whether the email is worth reading. Take a look at the example on the slide here. United eFairs has gone on too long in their subject line, and you can't see the full impact of it. However, the vertical response subject line, of course, is just short enough to fit, and you can see exactly what the email is about. Two, don't repeat your from label in your subject line. The subject line space is too valuable, and there's no need to mention your company name again if it's already clearly visible in your from label. If we look at the example again here, United, had they not repeated their from label in their subject line, then the entire subject line would likely have fit and everyone would have been able to see it. There's also always been a lot of talk about avoiding words like free in your email. I don't think it's a big deal to use words like that so long as you do so in strict moderation. There's no reason not to mention free shipping in your subject line if the whole point of your email is to offer free shipping to your subscribers. But one thing you do want to avoid is trying to mask words like free by adding extra characters or spaces. This is a pure spam tactic. Any good spam filter is going to assume you're up to no good if you're purposely misspelling gotcha words and your email is going to be more likely to get filtered then. In the example on the slide again, you can see the Coke versus Pepsi email includes the word free with a space between every letter. That email went straight into the spam folder. You also want to avoid excessive punctuation and all capitalization. Excessive exclamations and what have you is something that's commonly seen in spam. So if you use a lot of punctuation, it can look like you're trying too hard to get the recipient's attention. And as far as a spam filter is concerned, you wouldn't need to try so hard if the recipient is expecting to hear from you. As for all caps, that's considered screaming on the internet. And an all cap subject line is going to be very off-putting to some of your subscribers and make them less likely to open and read your message. Now let's actually move past the header of the email and look into some of the content. You're going to want to make sure some of your best content is above the fold. 
In purely email terms, above the fold means you want to make sure that good content is immediately viewable in the average Outlook or Mac Mail preview pane. Anyone using an email browser that shows them the first part of the email when they click on it will use those parts of the email they first see to help determine whether they should continue reading that email. It's like the first page of a book. If someone isn't hooked after that first page, they're going to be less likely to buy that book and continue reading it. Thinking along those same lines, always try to avoid using one large image or a mass of images as your sole email content. There are two reasons behind this recommendation. The first reason can be seen in the example right here on the slide. Many email browsers will turn images off by default and require the end user to choose which images they want to view on an email by email basis. The purpose behind this is to protect users from spam. So if you send an image on the email to such a recipient, then all they're going to see when they open the email up is a broken image. Without any other content to go with this broken image, they have no reason to think that turning the images on would be worthwhile and are going to be more likely to skip over your email or unsubscribe than they would otherwise be. The second reason is that many spam filters consider image-only or very, Im very image-heavy emails to be suspicious. The reason for this is not too long ago, more than half of all spam was image-based. Spammers had adapted the filters that read an email's content to determine if it was spam. And they adapted to this by placing all their content in an image, which obviously couldn't be read by a filter that was used to reading text. So to fight this, a lot of email providers tighten their security and to make it more likely that an image-only email would get filtered by the spam filter. So if you send an email out that is image-only or very close to image-only, then you're running a bigger risk that your email is going to get filtered as spam. Now this doesn't mean you shouldn't have images in your email. It just means you should be using your images to illustrate your HTML and text content. At most, I'd say that no more than half of your email's screen real estate, what you can see actually in the email, should be images. So let's continue on here. You want to try to avoid long blocks of copy. An email that includes paragraphs that are more than a few sentences long can be fairly daunting to read. Remember that most recipients aren't going to read your entire email. They're going to scan it for things that interest them before they move on to the next message in their inbox. It can be hard to scan big blobs of eight sentence long paragraphs and your readers are going to be less likely to find the info that interests them if they can't easily scan your content. So based on that, it can be very helpful to break at least some of your copy into concise bullet points. Well-spaced bullet points grab the eye and are very easily digestible. You also want to be sure to include several links back to your site so people can easily link over if they're interested. There's no need to go over, overboard with this and add 20 or 30 links. But I think at least three links is a good idea. You can have one at the top, you know, maybe link your logo, one in the middle or in the sidebar area so people can jump after they've read some of your content, and then one at the bottom so recipients can make the jump after they've looked over your whole message. On the slide here, we can see an example BizJournal's email, and I think this is a pretty good one. You see a lot of eye-catching content right in the preview pane, and they've broken the message up into easily readable bytes and use an image solely for illustration instead of relying on that, on that image for all of their content. So I have a couple more slides about content here, so let's keep on going. You want to personalize, but um, you know, personalizing your email with your recipient's name or other info, that's, not a, that's never a bad idea. If done right, it's going to provide a connection to the recipient that might not otherwise be there. But when you are personalizing your email, you want to be sure you have the right data associated with each address. Now, just as an example, sending me an email that says, Dear Richard, I wanted to send you this email because you've expressed interest in our blueberry cheesecake ice cream is great. But obviously, sending me an email that says, Dear Melinda, I'm sending you this message because you said you don't like our blueberry cheesecake ice cream is not so great, since my name is, of course, not Melinda, and I very clearly enjoy blueberry cheesecake ice cream. You also don't want to forget your postal address. For one thing, it's the law, and it helps show, and it also helps show the email is le legitimately came from you. Also, you should include a phone number there if your business is accessible by phone. This provides you another method for subscribers to contact you should they not want to reply to the email or visit your site. 
You should also always, always, always include a fully working unsubscribe method. If you use vertical response, of course, you don't have to worry about this since we take care of unsubscribes for you. But if you're not using us, just please be sure to always include an unsubscribe. Otherwise, you'll be breaking the law and annoying anyone who no longer wants to hear from you and annoying people via email when I was a very long time ago. You should also be sure to remind recipients of how they signed up for your list. A short message like, you're receiving this email because you requested the newsletter from our website at www.example.com never hurts. It also serves to remind people of the reason you're writing them in case they've forgotten. This will, like several other things I've mentioned so far, make recipients more likely to respond positive, positively to your email and less likely to complain. You should also include a forward to a friend mechanism in your email. This is going to remind your recipients to forward your email to potentially interested people. And also, forwarding options like the one we offer here at Vertical Response will give those friends who've received a forwarded message the opportunity to opt into your mailing list. So it can be a great way to grow your list through what are essentially referrals. So now that we've talked about content, I want to take a quick look at the fonts you might use with that text part of your content. So even though computers are very obviously getting better and better, not all fonts can be found on every computer out there. Just as, another, just as an example here, one of my favorite fonts, which is Helvetica, is the default font on a Mac computer, but it's not bundled with Windows. And this is, even, this is a very commonly used font in, in print and in other places. So we would recommend sticking with a font that is considered web-friendly and universal. This would be Arial, Verdana, Trebuchet, or Times New Roma in Georgia. There's, of course, two different types of fonts, sans serif and serif fonts. And if you're wondering what the difference is between serif fonts and sans serif fonts, serifs are the very small finishing strokes found at the end of typed characters. Serif fonts have these finishing strokes, and sans serif fonts don't have them. If you look closely at the Times New Roman and Georgia fonts, you can see the serifs there on the end of the T and the, and the G. There's been a lot of discussion about what type of font is more legible, but I don't think there's a big enough difference in appearance, especially in web use, to worry about whether you use serif fonts or sans serif fonts. It's only going to be important to use a font that nearly everyone has, so they don't end up seeing their default font, which is often Times New Roman, in place of yours. As far as font size is concerned, I'd stay within the 10 to 14 point range for the bulk of your text. Any smaller than that, the email is going to be more difficult to read. And any bigger than that, and it could make your email look more like spam. Since spammers, again, have often used really large fonts and things like that to try and grab people's attention. This doesn't mean you should never go over 14 points, but I'd limit your larger text to titles and, and things like that in the email. As far as font color is concerned, I'd avoid white on a dark background just for the sake of readability. I'd also avoid the four colors reference on the slide just for delivery's sake because spammers have often used funky colors to grab attention and because the colors I referenced here are just not really very pretty. Let's go on to the next slide. So now that we've talked about your content, I just want to talk about some, just some basic best practices in dealing with email marketing or direct marketing. Remember that repetition can be a good thing in your email. If you're giving the reader more than one opportunity to respond within that email, it's, it's good. If you don't, um, don't just put your links, as I mentioned earlier, at the bottom of the email or just in one place, put it throughout the email. Because you never know whether someone's going to read the email in, in its entirety or just scroll to the bottom or look at the top. So be sure to place, place your link or place your message in several place, places where people can see it. Focus your email on the offer. Don't, you don't want to confuse your reader with too many messages in, the, in your email. Unless, you, unless you're sending out a newsletter that you send out once a month that mentions a lot, of thing, a lot of things, if you're focusing on a sale, then mention that sale in the email and maybe add a few more things at the bottom, but really focus on that sale. You should have a call to action. When you're planning your email, ask yourself what it is you want the reader to do. Do you want them to buy something now? Do you want them to sign up for, for your site? Do you want them to register for an event? Make that message very clear in the layout of the email so they see exactly what, what you're wanting them to do. And create a sense of urgency around your promotion. If you want your recipients to, tend to attend an event, 
ask them to sign up by a certain date to guarantee their spot. You know, if you're having a sale, create a discount that's good only for a certain period of time. And then also, when sending an email to your recipients, talk to them, not at them. Email is a much more personal medium. People are used to hearing from their friends, just making very basic plans via email. And getting a message that's like a circular in a newspaper can not, is often not very effective. So if you can use your email to create newsletters or pass information onto your users, speak to them. Give them something worth making the email, making the email worth reading. That's very important in driving your response up. So this is going to be the end of my part of the presentation. I'm going to hand things over to Alf. But before I do that, I actually want to do a quick poll here. Alf is going to do a demo, of course, of how to use the email canvas in vertical response and some of the other tools we have, how to use them effectively to, to put the best practices I've just talked about here to use. So I'm going to do a poll asking which email creation tool in vertical response you most often use. The options are the email wizard, the canvas, whether you bring in your own HTML through the freeform tool, whether you just use text only, and whether you don't use vertical response at all. And I'll let this poll go here for, for about 10 or 15 seconds. All right, we've got some responses coming in. All right, here. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. There we go. And then let's take a look at the results. And the results here, we see that 22% of people are using the email wizard, 31% using the email canvas, 30% bring in their own HTML into the system, 4% are using text only, and 14% say they don't use vertical response at all. Uh, that hurts my feelings, of course, but I'm fine with that. Maybe we'll convert you over to using vertical response in the future. So now, just give us a moment here, and I'm going to switch things over to Alf, and he's going to show you around the vertical response account and how to put some of the tools there to better use. Great. Thanks, Richard. Let me get set up here and um, see if we can't put some of those best practices you just spoke about into uh, use here. Uh, just give me a second while I pull up our uh, vertical response account. Sorry, everyone, I left the, the screen a mess as usual, <laughs> which is making it harder for Alf to, there we are. to get into the account. So I'm going to log in here uh, to our account. Let me get to All right, great. You should also be seeing a vertical response account now. I'm going to pull into our home page. And first thing I'm going to do here is create a new email. I'll do that by clicking the new email link in our home page in the email section. So uh, we have four ways to create uh, an email. Um, uh, you can use the email wizard, which is a basic step through process that gives you uh, fixed ways to um, display your content, you know, image on the left, image on the right. It's really simple and really quick, so if you're looking to get something out right away, it might be your best bet. The email canvas, which I'll cover a, a bunch today, is a full-fledged um, WYSIWYG editor, so it's a HTML editor that lets you uh, use a toolbar similar to Word or Dreamweaver if you're using uh, something as advanced as that to uh, build your email from scratch. Um, we also offer some layouts which I'll go through. Uh, freeform HTML, which is uh, for those of you who are using Dreamweaver or some other HTML editor, uh, you can just take that code. There's no need uh, to not use that and just paste it into our system and, and send it out. And last but not least, we have text only for those who just want to send a plain text message out. Uh, we can offer that as well. So uh, let's get started here. Canvas. And let's do Canvas. And so hopefully what this is going to do for anyone who's using the Canvas is give you 
you know, give you more of an idea of some things you may not already be doing with it. And then if you happen to be using the wizard, the canvas gives you a lot more tools at your disposal than the wizard does. So maybe now you'll want to start using the canvas and, uh, and do more with your email than you were before. That's right. So when you get into your canvas, you're presented with this um, blank canvas and uh, along with this toolbar. Uh, today we're going to talk about pretty much a lot of these tools that we offer here. But one I really want to point out is this Choose Layout button. So let me click that. The, um, we offer a bunch of layouts that we've created here um, to get, help get you get started. So we have columns on the right, columns on the left, three columns. Um, we've also created some themed ones like uh, real estate, um, salon and spa, um, and retail. These are, all, these are all great starting points where you can actually click on these and let me pull this one in here. And um, use this as your starting point. You can then come in, select all the stuff, delete it, and put your own content in there, uh, as simple as that. Um, what I'm going to do for you today is actually recreate this layout here from scratch to show you how easy it is to actually use this tool from a blank canvas. So to do that, I'm going to go back into my Choose Layout. And I will click on a Start from Scratch. Great. So uh, if you remember, our uh, layout had multiple columns. People love columns, and this tool is great to, uh, off, you know, to get started doing columns layouts. So um, right in here, we have a set of tools. Most of them are grayed out now. Um, th these are our table tools. We use tables in HTML to create columns. Uh, so let me get started by clicking on this Create a New Table. So our uh, layout that we're um, copying here had two columns two main columns and three rows. We had a header row, a content row, and a footer row. Um, I always put a cell padding of, a, say, five in here, so this gives my, my cells a little bit of space so all my content isn't crammed together. Um, I like my email centered, so I will center this. Uh, a width of 650. Now, we recommend anywhere between 550 and 700 to kind of get that sweet spot of um, people's uh, inbox preview panes. Uh, depending on where uh, a user has their pane, pane positioned, whether it's on the right or below, it, it, w this is kind of like your sweet width. So uh, we're going to go with 650. Um, and I will give this a background color of a little bit of an orange yellow. So let me insert this. So there you go. Here we have our starting um, email layout. So you notice some of these columns uh, are, we have six, six places to place content, but our header row needs to be across the entire email. So to sim just simply click in one of these cells and drag across to highlight both. This will highlight a bunch of new actions that you can now do with this, co this column. So what I want to do is actually merge these table cells. So that, that'll give me a header and a footer. And areas to place content in the middle. So if you uh, can remember um, the example I showed you, we had some content on the right, but then two columns of content on this side. So what we're going to do to make that happen is actually insert another table inside of this cell so we can get our multiple column layout. So to do that, we're going to use our right click on our mouse. If you're using a uh, Mac, you want to do control click, but newer Mac ma mice have uh, two mouse buttons as well. Right clicking is going to give you a um, pop-up menu that is specific to the, to the content that you're working on. So at this time, we want to insert a new table. So we'll get our trusty old dialog box back. Um, and in this case, we want to do two columns and two rows. Again, a cell padding of five. Alignment doesn't matter uh, in this case because we're placing this within inside a confined space. Uh, width, we want to come in at 100% because we want it to take up the entire width of that cell. And um, just so it makes our content easier to read, we're going to give this a background color of white. So let me insert that. So now it's looking a little bit more like what we saw earlier. Um, again, I'm going to combine these just so have a place to put our a little more flexibility in our content. So what's next? Now we have to add some text, some content. So um, 
here at Vertical Response, we get content for our newsletters in many ways. You know, some people in marketing write some stuff, and, and you know, our CEO is great. She writes content as well. So it comes from many different places when we're putting together the newsletter. Uh, some could come from Word. Some can be shared in uh, Google Doc. Um, so I'm going to go through some ways to get content into uh, your layout. First, let's go into our Google Doc. So this, this is a, um, some content that's been shared that we can simply just copy and paste right into our layout. Pretty simple. Now, if someone was using Word, we would go about it a little bit different because Word tends to um, add some extra hidden characters that you don't see when you select your content. So here's a, here's a Microsoft Word document that someone's given me for content. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to copy and paste this. But I'm going to paste it a little bit differently. So I want this in my right column here. I'm going to click in my right column. And then I'm going to choose the Paste from Word feature. So by pasting my text right in using this feature, it's going to get rid of all of that weird stuff that you might see if you're using Word. Now this isn't um, this isn't something that's specific to using vertical response in Word. It's it's known throughout all HTML editors. If you're pasting stuff from Word, you're just going to have problems. Um, Microsoft uh, likes to play with us that way. So now we have our, our text in here. It's it's looking good, but you know that's not the font I want. So um, instead of going in here and actually selecting all of these things and choosing a new font, I'm going to do this globally by uh, using this document properties button. So let me click on document properties, and I'm presented with a dialog box that allows me to um, adjust a bunch of different things with this document. But I'm really just going to focus on. Um, our font size and our font family. I'll come in 12 points because uh, that's a best practice that Richard mentioned earlier. There we go. It's starting to look a little, little more, bit more like a email newsletter. Um, there is one little thing that I'm noticing here is that my content seems to be floating towards the middle of everything. So again, I'm going to select in here, right click, and I'm going to adjust my table cell properties. And here I'm going to do a vertical alignment of top. So here I'm going to take all my content and align it to the top of that cell. I'll do it again for you. Table cell properties and a vertical alignment of top. You're not going to see much difference here. It's too much content. So let me go back. And I would just add while Alf is doing that, that obviously if you're using a layout, you can use all of these Tips, yeah. Whether you're starting from scratch or using a layout, you can change the layout as much as you want using any of this information. Exactly. None of those layouts that we offer are, are written in stone. They're just a starting point for you. So, you know, what else do we need in our newsletter? We need images, right? So let's get some images in here. Um, we have click the layout where you want to insert your image, and then click this little Add Image button. So this is going to pull up our media library. So our media library is a great place where you can store all the images you want for any of your email campaigns. We offer 25 megabytes of storage, which is more than enough. You'll never need actually more than that. Um, and if you do, you can just delete some and, and add some more. Most images for email are very small, and I'll show you that in a second. So here's, uh, here's our logo. So let me click that. Um, here we're going to insert it, but we also want to um, adjust some of the uh, attributes to this logo. For one of the most important things is our alternative text. So I'm going to make this a little more. So one of the reasons why we use alternative text is n not, or actually a lot of email browsers these days um, hide images by default. So someone gets your inbox, they'll you know, say, hey, you know, show me the image. There'll be a button to show you the images. So this is one of the reasons why you really don't want to use an image-only email. Um, but you know, so to get around some of that hidden image issue, we use our alt text. So 95% of the browsers actually will display the alt text in place of the hidden image. So 
your reader won't be totally confused about you know what they're seeing on the screen. In this case, they might see the word magazine logo um, in that place. So um, one of the other things I want to set here is a border to zero. So um, here, let me show you exactly if I don't set border to zero. So here we have our logo inserted nicely. Um, now remember, I didn't set the border to zero. I just left it blank. So by default, HTML um, puts a border of one around an image should you link it. So if I were to link this image to my website, you'll see that ugly blue border around your image. And I know a lot of people see this and they wonder, hey, how do they get this border? I, it, get, get rid of it, please make it go away. So the, re the reason why this is showing up is because by default, a linked image has a border of one. That's an HTML standard. So to get rid of that, you actually have to set your border to zero. So here I'm gonna use the right click again. I'm gonna come down to image properties on this image. I'm gonna set my border to zero and voila no border, but the image is still linked. So let me go through adding a few more images and show you some situations that you might come into. So here we need an image of an Ames chair, if you remember from our example. But I don't seem to have it in here, but not to worry, I do have it on my desktop. Let me just show you how easy it is by clicking on the add images to add an image from your desktop. Where's my current image? Done. There it is. But wait, this image is way too big for email, 410K. But my other images here you can see are coming in at 5K, 15K. So what I want to do is actually edit this image down to uh, emailable size. So uh, you can do that simply by clicking on the pencil icon uh, next to your image. Actually, this image is so big, I can't even see it. If I were to insert it into my email, there it is down in the corner. It would be way too big. So I'm going to bring it down to a more respectable size, say 150 pixels wide resize. So by actually using this resize tool um, and saving, we are automatically optimizing this image for you for web. So um, same thing if you're no used to using Photoshop, there's that save to web option which does the optimization for you. This tool does it as well. So you don't have to worry about, you know, is it the right size? Am I gonna overload my um, reader's inbox? Um, you, you don't have to worry about that using our tool here. So let me save these changes. Now in your media library, you see the original and the new one, which is down to 4K, which is a big difference and it's gonna be, you know, make your readers a lot happier. Here again, I'm gonna make sure my alt text is right. While Alpha is typing in that alt text, I would add to what he mentioned earlier about how email browsers, many of them will show the alt text if people can't see the image. I also add that if someone, if any of your recipients happen to be blind and they're using a screen reader, the alt text, if you add that for an image, the screen reader will actually read that alt text to to the recipient. That's true. So here I'm going to insert another image. Starting to look a little bit more like our email. All right, let me just show you one more example of um, some image manipulation here. So um, for here we want to enter our formula chair. And the alignment pull down. So here, if you just stick your uh, image in there, it's going to be kind of like shoved in, top left. The image, is, the text is not really going to wrap around it very nicely. So you want to use this alignment pull down to give you a little bit more flexibility. Um, so I want this image to actually be aligned to the right, which is going to align my image to the right and have the text flow around it to the left. And I want to give it a horizontal spacing of five. And you'll see as I click away here, it actually just adds a nice little amount of padding around here to make your email just look that much better. And again, border of zero, because should I want to link this image later, I don't want that ugly blue border around it. And 
I'll just show you real quick. Using a line left, same thing. I'm sorry, hitting my wrong boxes. Horizontal spacing of five gives me that nice. If I wanted vertical spacing, uh, I could do that, and I'll give you a blown out number here just to see how much space it adds here. Um, I could do that as well, but in this case, I don't need any vertical spacing. So. There we go. The, the email's uh, looking pretty good. Um, let me go in and add one more image here. Some tips from our uh, our uh, owner here. And actually, while I'm doing this, I'll sh I'll demonstrate one more cool feature of the media library. So let me go in and edit. And so I'm gonna. We have different features in here: crop, flip, rotate. I'm gonna use the crop tool just to show you how easy it is to actually come in and give this guy a better headshot. So by clicking and dragging on your picture is gonna give you these little markers to uh, come in and get your perfect crop. Hit the crop button. Done. Save changes. Beautiful. And again, that's saved for web. So if it wasn't optimized, it is now. him actually a border of one um, just to show you now he looks good with a little black border around him very good so again adding images simple as that optimizing images again pretty simple so um, adding a link select the text you'd like to link and then click the insert link button Again, there we go. Starting to shape up, looking like an email. All the tools that you would normally use in Word, say, are available to you. I'm going to come in and make things look a little fancier. You're welcome to do that. Let's use uh, one of those serif fonts that uh, Richard was speaking of earlier. Get your piece of the week. Great. So um, here I want to point out another very powerful feature of vertical response is this insert down. So we can use this to personalize by uh, merging in email address, first name, last name, title, actually anything that you have in your mailing list can be merged into this layout. Um, but two of, two of my favorite are actually the first two right here, and that is the hosted version of an email and the forward to a friend link. So if you have a, um, if you have you know, readers who have for some reason a problem reading your email, um, you can make sure you add this link at the top of your email so they can just click this email and view the hosted version. Um, we host uh, your email for you free, so this is, is something that you really don't want to pass up. Um, another thing that every email should have is a forward to a friend link. Viral um, email is very powerful. When you someone clicks this link, they actually get a real copy of this email, not not forwarded from your friend, but actually sent again from our server, so you know it's good. And um, they are also asked if they want to opt into your list. So you could be growing your email list by using this link, and there's really no reason to not use it. And, and I would add, even though the email comes from our servers, if a friend forwards it on, it, the email very clearly states it comes from the friend, so that people yes. don't <laughs> think the email is spam. <laughs> Of course, we would never want that. So there you have it. I, and it, this is uh, how pretty, how easy it is to um, recreate a simple layout like you saw. You come in and uh, I could tweak it this all day, but I won't. I'll spare you uh, the pain of watching me. <laughs> <laughs> all right then. So so thank you very much, Alf. Now Alf and I are going to take some questions, and before I do that, going to put a, another poll up for for everyone to take. Let me.
bring that up here. So this new poll is what other tools are you using aside from email in your marketing efforts? The first answer is whether you're using a blog, next is direct mail, next is banner ads, and the next one is viral. Like a YouTube video or social networking too, which I actually meant to put in that poll and I'm not sure, not sure why it didn't show up. Obviously I didn't hit save or something. So viral or social networking, like if you're on Facebook, do you have a Facebook group or are you on MySpace, things like that. And we'll let this go for another 10 seconds or so and see how everyone answers. Here we go. Go ahead and close the poll and we'll show the results. So 22% of you are using blogs, 48% direct mail, 23% banner ads, and 12% viral and social networking. The um, That's great. It sounds to me like we need to do a webinar on our postcard product for direct <laughs> mail people. It does. For everyone using direct mail who may be interested in the postcard, it might be, might be good to do a webinar on that. Also blogs, obviously blogs are very useful tools. It's good to see some people using it because here we, our CEO has a blog. She updates on a regular basis with useful information about the company, about new releases, and about email marketing in general. And that, you know, that helps drive people to the site. To people who aren't even users of Vertical Response can get information there, which may make them want to become a user in the future as uh, they learn more about what we know about. Anyway, I'll hide the results of this of this poll since it didn't turn out exactly like I wanted it to since the question I thought I added was not there. I'm embarrassed to even have it on the screen. All right. So now we're going to look at some questions that came in during the, um, during the presentation. Give me a second to pull these up and we will uh, and we'll answer some questions here. Let's see, I'm just trying to find a, a good starting question. Somebody has asked just a, a good question to start, will there be a hard copy of this presentation? And the answer to that is yes. This presentation has been recorded. We will be hosting on the site. should be up tomorrow afternoon if you go to the education and support section of Vertical Response, which is a link right from the, the home page. You'll be able to find the video there and watch it. And that will include these questions too. I'm going to answer this question about adding an animated GIF to uh, the canvas or Freeform. If you're using Freeform and hosting your own images, yes, go ahead and use an animated GIF. Our um, media library doesn't support animated GIF. Uh, we made that decision, I believe, because there are some problems using um, Outlook 2007 with animated GIF and some, I don't know if it's Gmail who also has a problem um, viewing animated GIF. So, you, you know, it, it's kind of a trial and error. You might want to do some testing, but, it, you know, I've used them in the past, and um, it, if if you um, use one, it, it won't not display the GIF, but it'll just show that first um, little slide in the, in the animation. Very good. Uh, someone actually mentioned that um, Zarif is actually pronounced Serif, which uh, I always try to say one, one stupid thing every presentation. So, yes, that would be Sans Serif and Serif, not Sans Serif and Serif but that's just usual for me. All right, let's find another good question here. I have a question, what stats are normal for opening, click through? In other words, what should I be shooting for? Um, normal is going to, is, it can be a hard thing to pin down because it's going to change from, depending on industry and what kind of email you're sending out. We have clients who get anywhere from 10% open rate to 80% open rate, depending on whether it's a newsletter that people are really looking forward to once a month or whether it just be you know, some marketing they signed up when they, for when they made a purchase. So it can vary. I would pin the average down at around mid-20s and opens, around 20% open, and then you know, 2 or 3% click-through is a pretty good click-through rate. Sometimes in lower can be a very good click-through rate too. But a good way to measure this is through a trends report. We have a trends report from 2006 on our site. You can download it. It actually breaks it down, the averages by industry and by type of email going out. And we're going to have a new trends report coming onto the site over the next month or so that will break down for 2007. I have another question here is, can information in the email be corrected once it has been sent out, like correcting spelling or a link? Well, correcting spelling or things like that in the email, you can't. Once the email is gone, the email is gone. People have received it. It's in there that's in their inbox, it's not being, it's not hosted somewhere and being shown to them, it's actually there 
where they can where they can look at it. So you can't change spelling. However, links since we track the links and they go through our servers to be tracked, you can actually go back into an email and after you send it out and change your links if you made a mistake or had a misspelling in there. So if you go in, once you send an email out, if you go to email, send email, and that'll be your reporting for the, all the emails you've sent out. You click on the name of the email you've just sent. The very first page that comes up is called the summary report. You scroll to the bottom of that page, you'll see each link in your email listed out. There's a little pencil icon next to each link. You click that, you can edit the link, save it, and then that will be the link that your recipients will be able to, to use to yeah, you, in that wherever. case, you're actually changing the link destination, not the link text. So if you misspelled the words click here, you're out of luck. Yeah, yeah. so if you misspelled <laughs> the words click here, that's going to stay misspelled. But if you actually made a mistake on the link, right. the actual link itself where people are going, then that you can change, and, um, and that can be fixed later on. Let's see, what else we got here? There's a question, are we charged for emails that are forwarded by a friend? And uh, you are not charged for that, that's free. If someone forwards the email to a friend, that's not going to cost you anything. Another question asking, can you save your layout that you've created? So if you, send, if you spend a lot of time working in the editor, like Alf just did, obviously you don't want to have to go back and do that again and again and again. So there's no like clear button just to save that layout for future use. But there's two ways you can, it's always automatically saved when you create it. So there's two ways you can access that email again. One, you create the email and just leave it in your drafts section, in your email section, and every time you want to use it, you go to the right to actions, which will be just to the right of the name of the email. Click that, there'll be an option to copy that email. You'll then create a copy then that you can edit and use to mail again. Also, any email that you send out through vertical response is in your sent emails or your reporting section. If you go there, go to actions, copy email, this is gonna put a copy of the email you sent out back into your drafts folder where you can edit it and use it again, and then that can be a template that you change and use over and over and over again for as long as you want to use it. Another question, I've been using the wizard. Can I use existing image library images in the Canvas? Definitely can. The image library is the same image library no matter what tool you're using to access it. So whether you've used the wizard before, if you start using the Canvas, all the same images are going to be there like before. Let's see here. Can you select a insert a field for custom fields that you've created? Right now in the insert a field drop down, the custom field is not going to it's not going to appear. But that doesn't mean you can't merge the data from a custom field in your list. The reason that it doesn't appear in the drop-down is because we don't load the list until after you've created your email. You choose your list after that point. So we don't know what custom fields are going to be in the list you choose to use. But if you want to use a custom field to merge data into your email, if you can just type it in manually wherever you want it to appear. So to merge a custom field, all you're doing is taking the exact name of that custom field. If I create a custom field called, just to go with an example I used during the presentation, ice cream, then I would be placing the word ice cream in between the curly brackets. So on your computer, next to the P, the letter P, you have brackets. The top brackets are the curly ones. So you do left curly bracket, type in ice cream, right curly bracket, and then that will merge the data about ice cream from your mailing list into your email. Let's see here. So a question here, if I want to use HTML code from Dreamweaver, I don't need to have meta, meta tags. Is that right? And I'll let Alf answer yes, that. Yes, that's right. Meta tags are, are specific for, um, the for the web. There's no um, search engine out there indexing your email, so there's no need to have those tags in there. Um, I would just start with the body tag and end with the body tag. All that extra stuff is, is junk in, as far as uh, we're concerned. Another question, I would like to use Dreamweaver CSS and copy and paste the code into Canvas. Does Canvas support CSS formatting? It does and it doesn't. So we don't recommend um, a CSS in your head because, uh, as I said before, all that stuff above the body is something we ignore. So, and, and it's not supported by a number of email clients. If you want to use CSS, I would use inline CSS.
Um, so that's when you're actually um, within the tag um, using a, a style attribute with your CSS definitions. Um, and I can follow up with uh, you um, individually to actually show you the code to do that. It's a bit advanced. All right. So we're going to take a couple more questions here, and then, we're, then we'll be done. Let's see here. Two more questions. Can you use the WYSIWYG editor with a template that has been created in Dreamweaver? So if you bring your HTML from Dreamweaver. Absolutely, absolutely. I do this all the time. I'm a visual person, and I use Dreamweaver. Um, and I paste it into, um, th if you look at the top of above the, the toolbar, you'll see the Edit Source tab. Let's click on that. Here you see the raw HTML, so just like you would get from Dreamweaver, or any HTML um, editor for that matter, you can paste your code right into here and then click back to Edit Graphical. And, and you know edit just like you do in Dreamweaver. Uh, Dreamweaver splits the, the screen top to bottom. We just put it on two different pages. Um, so yes, go ahead and do that. It's, it's, it's no problem at all. All right, so we will take one more question here, and then we will uh, bring an end to the webinar. Let's see what questions would be a good way to go out. I'm just trying to pick a really good question to close on. I'll, I, found, I think this is a pretty good question here. A question about best practices. Will using a similar subject line each month for a newsletter be better than trying to create a different attractive subject line each month? Well, it depends on the situation. If you are trying to get, if you're going to have something that might be really attractive to your subscribers, like if you have a website and you do all your sales online and you happen to be doing free shipping, something like that, then you might want to mention that in your subject line. It's always a good idea. But if you have a monthly newsletter and you send it out every month and you have the same thing and people expect to get that newsletter, then you get good open rates on it, they like to read it, it gives them some good information, then I would say stick with a similar subject line each time because it just makes the email more, you know, more visible to them. That's what they expect to see every month. But if you're doing more advertising type emails to your base. I think it's a good idea to describe exactly what's going on in the email. If it's a sale, talk about that the email is a sale in the subject line. Free shipping, talk about free shipping. Just describe what's going on because then people are going to be more likely to open the email because they can see exactly what they're going to see inside. But newsletter that you send out every month at the same time, I try to stick with similar subject lines each time. All right then, so that is the end of the webinar. Two things to note here before we go. One is that, again, this is recorded, so it's going to appear on our site. should be up tomorrow afternoon. If you go to Education and Support from the homepage of Vertical Response, you'll find, a, you'll find it there to view it. Also, uh, any questions that we did not answer here today, we're going to, there's going to be a section in the VR Lounge in the community section of your account. If you go there, there will be a section devoted to this webinar and the one we did last week on the same topic with questions and answers from that webinar. You can then ask follow-up questions of, of Alf and I there and then ask further questions if you want to do that. But that is it for now. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. Yeah. And uh, have a good day.